Hey everybody, welcome to Silver Griffin Makes a Thing, where we make whatever we feel like at the moment. Today we're going to make one of these beautiful hand-painted boxes, and can you guess what we're going to put in it? That's right, we're going to put dice. This is a Dungeons & Dragons dice box from one of my best friends. For this project you will need the following. Acrylic paints, satin varnish, fabric glue, a pencil and scissors, craft felt, a small wooden box, and of course a cup of tea, or maybe several. I found this small wooden box at Michael's. You can usually find them with the wood burning supplies. I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons for a number of years. Last August, I started DMing for a new group. I made several of these boxes for Christmas, and now that my roommate has started playing, it's time to make one for her too. She loves Norse mythology, especially anything related to Loki, the god of mischief and magic. So her box is going to feature Jormungandr, the world serpent. For a pose, I was inspired by this picture of a snake eating an egg. And for colors, I was inspired by this beautiful rainbow boa with iridescent scales. I did several concept designs and practice sketches to make sure I really understood how to draw this serpent. My roommate liked the one on the bottom left best, so that's the one I went with. Now it's time to start. I begin by laying out guidelines on the box in pencil. I didn't sand or prime the wood because I like the sort of rough hewn look the untreated wood has after it gets painted. There are four components to this box's exterior design. The black stained wood, the rose gold trim, the knotwork border, and the main element of Jormungandr inside the circle on the top. I realized later that the black paint completely covers my line art. Whoops. Still, it's nice to lay out the design and make sure it looks nice and proportional on the box. It's okay to make mistakes at this stage, since we're just going to cover them up with paint anyway. I'm freehanding all of my lines here. I've been drawing my entire life, so I have a fairly good eye. Use a ruler if that's more comfortable for you. I quickly sketch out the lines of the ring around my main element, then begin laying out Jormungandr. I start with the head, referencing photos on my laptop for accuracy. The coils of his body are next. I do change this later on because I didn't like how this first pass had his coils touching the border. I use one of my own 20-sided dice to nail down the angles and proportions of the die Jormungandr will be holding in his mouth. My roommate has a real soft spot for all of Loki's children, and she views them as characters in their own right, rather than as monsters. To reflect this, I wanted a look that was regal and magnificent instead of fierce and threatening. This pretty noodle just wants to guard her dice, not consume the gods. I based Jormungandr's design off of a constrictor snake rather than a venomous snake like a cobra or a viper. Sure, Jor has venom. During Ragnarok, Thor slays him, then takes like three steps and dies of the world serpent's venom. But this is a snake big enough to wrap around the whole world and swallow the occasional giant statue of Thor whole. He doesn't need big viper fangs. Sketch complete, it's time to start painting. This crunchy slaw lid from Trader Joe's has been my palette since I started painting about 10 or 12 years ago. I love how it's covered in layers and layers of paint, like some weird archaeological record of my artistic history. For this project, I'm using mostly Liquitex and Golden Artist Grade paints. They're really good quality, and if you're at all serious about painting, I do recommend their artist or professional grade paints. Paints are made up of a pigment which is the actually colored part, and a medium or a binder. That's the part that suspends the pigment in a form easy to work with and binds the pigment to your surface. A lot of paint brands have multiple grades of paint. Beginner or craft paint have less pigment and more binder, 
and aren't as of great a quality, but they are cheaper. Professional or artist grade paints have more pigment leading to a richer color and the binders they're made with are less likely to discolor over time. If you really want to get into painting, it's worth spending a little more and splurging on the good stuff. It will last you longer and the results will be a lot better. I go over the whole box with washes of black paint liberally mixed with water. Doing this with washes instead of thick layers of paint will give a final result that nicely shows the grain of the wood without showing brush strokes. Because we're painting directly onto untreated wood, the wood tends to suck the paint into itself. This leaves a weathered, ashy sort of finish that is, well, it's a look. It's an okay look and you could leave it that way if you want, but I want something that looks a lot less weathered. The surfaces that will be exposed get three to four washes of black paint. Allow plenty of time for each layer to dry before starting the next. Now that we have our prepped surface, I resketch my line art. If you want the box to be its natural color, I would recommend hitting it with a layer or two of sealant. That way the raw wood won't just drink in the paint you're using to do the actual artwork. Here I'm going in and sketching out the knotwork pattern that will form the border. I make a pointed U shape in each corner, then mark three parallel, perpendicular lines on each. These will give me something to aim for and form the starting and end points for each of our interlacing lines. I really, really don't like drawing out knotwork. It's kind of a pain. But I did this knotwork motif on the other boxes I made, and part of me wanted this one to match. And hey, if I went to all this effort on boxes for myself, my sister, and one of my best friends, it seemed wrong not to put in the effort for my other best friend. I make undulating lines that ripple down the edge of the box, carefully interweaving them and trying to make them as even as possible. Here's the completed guidelines. Now it's time to paint these in rose gold. I don't have rose gold paint. A bit of an oversight since it's one of my roommate's favorites. What I do have is Liquitex Iridescent Bright Copper. I mix it with transparent red paint to make my copper a more ruddy hue, and some titanium white to brighten it and make it sort of pinky. I apply this to the edges of the box, following my guidelines and the natural line where the pieces of wood meet. I'm using a flat shader brush here because the flat squared edge gives a really, really nice edge for making straight lines. Once again, you're going to want to do a couple of coats on this, probably two to three to get it nice and opaque. Here we have our finished edges. I did mess up in a few places, but it's easy enough to fix that with a few dabs of slightly thinned black paint. Next, I start painting the knotwork. This was really tedious. It took a little over two hours, I think. I am sorry for the off-center shots and my head getting in the way all the time. This is my first film video and I'm still getting used to my setup and learning where both I and my project are in the shot. I'm planning on getting a real tripod and microphone soon, so hopefully that helps. As I'm painting, I'm watching a lot of craft videos on YouTube. My most recent inspirational binges are Delightful and The Doll Fairy. I'm being really careful with my painted lines here. I'm using one of my teeniest little brushes and thinning out my paint with a little bit of water so it doesn't get all globby and gross. More black paint lets me correct any mistakes and an occasional touch up helps even out the color. Here we are all done with our quote unquote metal work. Now it's time to get to our central motif and our Jormungandr painting. I start by mixing up a bright green paint and filling in the circle with my square headed shader brush. As you can see, the paint winds up kind of patchy in this first coat. This is partially because we're painting on black, which shows through just about anything, and partially because most acrylics are just a little bit translucent. Some are even entirely transparent. This makes them good for making washes and translucent layers of color, but it does mean you often need several coats to fully cover your surface, even with paints marked as opaque. Check the tube to see if a particular paint is opaque, semi-opaque, or transparent. Base color done, I use a skinny little brush and some watered down burnt umber paint to lightly lay in my outline. For some reason, my pencil just wasn't leaving marks on the paint, so I did it this way instead. I've never tried to paint iridescence before, so I did some tests on a piece of scrap craft foam that I had lying around just trying to figure out what colors to lay down first. 
I realized that to do this properly, I would need fairly transparent colors, so I laid down patches of white where the iridescent highlights would go to give my pigments a chance of being bright enough to look right. I start by laying down diluted ultramarine blue paint, starting to build up the outer edges of my rainbows. I don't know for certain if the blue and violet end of the rainbow spectrum should be near the edge of the highlight or the center, or if the red should be. I'm sure the way the light refracts through the structures of the iridescent material follows some particular rule, but I didn't get that deep into it. I was more concerned with getting a nice result, and I made sure to stay consistent throughout the image. Iridescence isn't actually caused by a pigment. Pigments absorb certain wavelengths of light and reflect others' backs in varying strengths. The reflected wavelength is picked up by the cone cells in our eyes and are interpreted as color by our brains. Iridescence, on the other hand, is a structural color. Light passes into a substance and bounces off of structures inside, refracting off of them like prisms. That's why the colors of an iridescent object seem to shift as the light shining on them changes. It's also why iridescence is so darn hard to paint. Once the blue is laid out, I start adding more colors to my rainbows. I use dioxazine purple and cadmium yellow as the extremes of my spectrum, then manage the shift from blue to yellow with phthalo green, which is a tealy sort of green, to a more yellow tinted emerald green. I use diluted paints and a damp, not wet, brush to apply them. When doing gradients, I like to do what I call feathering, gently pushing and pulling my wet paint with short, quick strokes until it's where I want it to be, and then blending it with the next color before it dries. Acrylics naturally dry pretty quickly, so you don't have as long to work with them as you would with something like oils. On the other hand, they dry faster than oils, so that, that's a plus. Here I'm going back with more layers of color and adding tints, that is, my base colors mixed with white, to the darker parts of my rainbows to brighten them up. This gives the iridescence a more glowy look, like it's actually made of light. And here's our finished rainbows. They don't shift quite yet, but we're going to do something about that later. I start painting in the body with red oxide. I like how this reddish brown contrasted with the green background, and it turned out to be a nice jumping off point to making a sort of dark copper color for Jormungandr's scales. We're back to using the flat shader brush to make nice, neat edges. I do run into a problem where this brush winds up being too wide for some of the smaller coils, so I do have to swap in and out. A couple of coats to make the base color opaque, and we can start rendering. I mix Naples Yellow into my red oxide for highlights and start working on developing the form. This was a bit tricky since the iridescent rainbows are placed right where I normally place my highlights, so I kind of had to play around with it. Burnt Umber and Ultramarine Blue get mixed with my red oxide to make my shadow colors. Shading with black can make your image look sort of flat and cold. I wanted my shadows to be rich and vibrant, so colored shading it is. I wanted a sort of metallic copper look for Jormungandr, and to do that I nudged my shadows a little bit away from the edge. This rim lighting that results really makes the surface look more reflective. I go back and forth for a while, darkening my shadows and really pushing my highlights. Since this is a colored metal look, I never push them all the way to white, instead leaving them a pale yellow. I finished the details off screen, painting in his eyes, mouth, and teeth, and his 20-sided die, along with his scales. Now it's time for my favorite part, interference paints! These are from Golden and feature iridescent particles in a transparent binder. They look best over black, but they'll really help our rainbows shimmer and shine. To use the iridescent interference paints, thin them out with a lot of water. You really just need a nice thin glaze. Paint these glazes over their corresponding colors. Gold over yellow, green over green, and so on. I am totally addicted to these paints. I pretty much don't paint anything that doesn't have a little splash of shimmery color on it somewhere, even if it's just in the eyes. I can't help it, they're so pretty! Last but not least, I paint the numbers on the die in gold. I paint it with the 20 facing up for lots of nat 20s when she plays. With the painting finished, it's time to varnish the box. I'm using Liquitex Satin Gloss Varnish so it won't be too shiny. Just pour a little on and brush smooth, cleaning up any drips. 
If you're wondering about the change of scenery, I finished recording this while I was dog sitting. I love pet sitting. It's so nice to get away sometimes and just play with other people's pets. It's great for the dogs too, since they can stay at home and not get all stressed out at some kennel. The final step is lining the box. Once the varnish is fully dry, I measure out the pieces I need on this craft felt and cut them out. The sides of the lid won't be covered, but the sides of the bottom will. Using fabric glue, I'm using Unique Stitch, glue the felt in place. Make sure the sharpie lines are facing down. You don't want them showing through. This project is actually super easy. The only part that gets complicated is the painting. But you can do whatever you want for the painting. It's your box, so let your imagination run wild. These boxes make great gifts for tabletop gamers, and they make lovely jewelry boxes too. If you are using it as a dice box, rest assured. I'm told that these boxes can hold an entire pound of dice, plus extra. I'm not there with my collection yet, but at the rate at which I acquire dice, it could totally happen, and probably sooner than I think. Oh my gosh, guys, I had to pause recording voiceover because the dogs were romping. This is what happens when you work with animals, I guess. I'm really excited about this channel. I've been wanting to make some kind of YouTube channel for a while, but I never could figure out exactly what I wanted to do. And I was worried I didn't have the right software, the right equipment, or the right setup. Well, I finally had an idea, and I said, to heck with it! I'm gonna make a video. Except... Spoilers, this is a practice video where I could make something really cool and figure out my video workflow. I'm pretty pleased with it and I'm super excited to get to my real plan. I'm collecting the supplies for it even now and I hope to be able to start on it soon. Here I'm just laying in and gluing the last few pieces of felt. With that finished, this beautiful Jormungandr dice box is done! It's so pretty! I love the rainbow iridescence I managed to render, and he looks so sweet and just a little bit mischievous. It's perfect for my roommate and for her dice collection. Thanks for joining me on this inaugural episode of Silver Griffin Makes a Thing. I know what I'm doing next time, but after that, who knows? We make what we feel like here, when we feel like it. Please leave a like or comment down below, and subscribe and ring the notification bell so you don't miss out on where our whims take us next.